So let's get started, right? Let's before the book. Yeah. Who is Trisha and Antoinette? So, my fellow Caribbean queens. Yes. Please you want, tell me your story. You want me to break out into song? Yes. <laughs> That's Billy Ocean, right? Caribbean queen. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we grew up in Brooklyn um, by our single, our single mom raised us. She migrated from Jamaica to the States to live the American dream. She was one of eight. Um, so we like to say we were raised by committee because our grandmother and our aunts had a say in every single thing we did. If we had to go to the corner store or go on a vacation, there was a conference call with everyone weighing in. So um, we looked at them as kind of our matriarchy. And they had such an unmatched passion for us to achieve a level of success because that's why they came to this country. So they really had a definition of the American dream being rooted in a doc, being a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And we knew we didn't want to do any of those things. So right after we graduated from college, we lied to them. We tricked them and basically said, study show, which there were, there no, were no studies, studies at the time. <laughs> um, study show, if you work for two years, it will strengthen your grad school applications, which we all know that's true. So essentially, we had two years to figure out what our roadmap was going to be, where they felt comfortable enough to kind of let us do it our way. And I think that was also the first introduction into the status quo, which a lot of people say is almost like a character in our book. Um, so I know we'll get into, into some of that too, but I guess to give a little background of kind of how we got to this place too from a career um, trajectory, I basically say the through line throughout my entire career has been that I look at innovation as my operating system. And I started in ad sales, working for Hot 97, Kiss FM. Um, so it was a big communications company that owned stations here in New York and then also across the US. So I started with a phone book in a cubicle. She just aged herself, phone book. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know those yellow big, big things? Um, and I basically had to figure out how, how I could get people to buy airtime on our airwaves. And the innovation component was, in every job that I had, it was always about, how can I do something that hasn't been done before? Ooh. Oh, that's that your phone. my phone. <laughs> <laughs> how, ca how could I essentially press play versus repeat? And in that regard, it was everyone was just selling spots as a transaction. I looked at that as an opportunity to offer creative services because no one was really doing that in radio. Um, so that gave me a leg up. But soon I was hit with a lot of ageism, like you're only 22. You need to work your way up and follow this path. So that's when I left and I went to go work at Excite. Once again, I'm going to date myself because that was. Um, Do any of you know what the site is? <laughs> so it was AOL and MSN were were the top two, and then Excite was the third, one of the top three portals. And I was there for six months after um, after about my going into my seventh month, the folks from MS Communications called me and said, we know you left to do this interactive thing. They didn't even call it digital back then. Uh, would you come back and help us launch our version of that because we know we need to be in the space? So I looked at that as um, a really defining moment because did, had I learned enough within those six months to be able to go back to kind of a formidable media company and teach them how to basically marry new media. And I remember calling Antoinette and saying, should I do this? Like, do I have enough of what it takes to actually be able to go back and steer and drive this new initiative? And she was like, no one really knows what's going on in Interactive anyway. I'm like, if you make mistakes, no one will even know. But if you can make an impact, they'll see that. So I took a shot, went back, and over the course of six years, grew it to a multi-million dollar business that they spun us off into our own company. So then we became our own entity. And it was at that point where Russell Simmons reached out to me and said, I love what you're doing there. Can you basically come and do that for us? What, her phone? Yeah. <laughs> it's buzzing. It's vibrating. <laughs> Can you come and do that for me? Because he had a digital media company. So I went there to basically redefine what he was doing within the space, again, using innovation as my operating system, and trying to figure out how we could transcend display ads and really build 
a really robust audience that would be really impressed by the editorial strategy and telling stories that you couldn't find everywhere else. And then, of course, being able to monetize that audience in more unique ways. So did that within two years, made the company profitable. Two years after that, I got it to a point where we could actually sell it. And that's where shit got real. <laughs> because I got to the point where now I had saved this company, built it up to uh, an amazing point, but now I was gonna be out of a job because it was being acquired. So I went to Russell and said, how does this even happen? I work so hard and then now I'm kind of out of work because I didn't wanna go with the company. And he said, okay, so what do you wanna do? So I basically pitched him on the idea of um, starting narrative, not in real time. I left, I went away, tried to figure out what I think, where I thought I had permission to play and where I thought there was a white space where I could actually innovate. So I looked at the advertising and marketing space and really realized that you had a lot of agencies that were identifying influencers, but they weren't really attaching a story to it. You had big box shops that were really focused on campaign-driven executions, so there wasn't kind of this integrated approach. And then you had culture shops that were really focused <laughs> in on identifying kind of what that next thing was going to be and how a brand could attach to that. And then you had digital tech shops that were building to spec. So my thesis was, could we create an agency that was really focused on redefining the rules of storytelling, leveraging technology and culture? So bringing tech and culture together to really innovate within the advertising marketing space. So one part ad agency and then one part innovation lab where we would really create monetizable product development. And he liked that idea. And Who wouldn't? Look and listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me the seed capital to, to start it. After going back and forth, I went out to meet with different VCs and private equity folks because Russell traditionally doesn't give you his own money. Most people don't give you uh, their own money, but he was going to set up meetings with VCs and private equity guys. But I was like, that's going to take too long. It's like I wanted it on my schedule and came back, we negotiated. He, of course, started and he was like, okay, we'll call this Rush Clark Stone. And I'm like, this is not an ad, this is not a law firm. <laughs> right. This is supposed to be creative. And he was like, and I'll be majority owner. And I was like, hold on, it's my idea. I'm doing all the work. And I got it to a place where he gave me this seed capital and then I became majority owner. And then we launched in April, 2013. One second, she's glossing over this. She walked away found another investor and then went to him and was like, oh, well, I don't need you anymore. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So that's important to be able to not, to not feel like, oh, well, it's Russell, so I have to kind of like take an L yeah. mm -hmm. just to keep that connection uh, and have the confidence to just be like, all right, I'll walk away and do it with someone else. Yeah. Because then he was like, hold up. And that gave me <laughs> leverage, right? To say, well, I have these two people over here that are willing to do it and their terms are a lot better than your terms. Um, but obviously I had a history with him, so there was proof of concept already there. He had wor I had worked for him for four years, so I think he had confidence that I would be able to pull it off. So it wasn't a huge leap. Um, and then opened the doors in uh, 2013 and really built um, you know, an amazing team. We started winning awards like Can Lions and Clio's and Webby's and Shorty's and then started securing patents for a lot of the technology stuff that we were working on. And I remember one of the first things um, when we started, everyone started putting us in a box of, you guys are a multicultural agency. Because I was black and because Russell was black, it had to be that way. So I really used technology as an equalizer because tech, you, there's no color. So I would use that as a way to really drive innovation so that people started seeing just these innovative campaigns and not, oh, well, you're black, so you must only be speaking to this cohort. Mm -hmm. And that helped a lot. Um, and then basically four and a half years in, I started getting calls for acquisitions, and then Will Packer, the filmmaker, um, a year to the day that we met, he acquired Narrative outright from, from Russell and I. She's the long-winded twin. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, while she was busy doing all of that, I really predicated a lot of my career on storytelling and redefining those rules. Growing up in Brooklyn, I don't know how many of you are from New York, but uh, we grew up watching the NBC local news and Sue Simmons was a local news anchor. So that was the first time I saw someone who looked like me on television. So I knew I wanted to be in entertainment and TV. I just didn't know it was possible until I saw her. And um, going to college and doing an internship, I had a full circle moment. I ended up interning at NBC for Sue Simmons. And it really solidified for me that, yes, I want to be in the television space, but I don't want to be an anchor. I realized that I wanted to be able to put the stories together and redefine who those stories were for and how they were said. Um, so I started at the Montel Williams Show. That was my first job out of college. So I just aged myself also. Um, and I worked my way up in the daytime space. It was very deliberate that I landed in daytime. As we mentioned earlier, we grew up with this amazing set of powerful women who raised us. So community has always been super important to us. So I really wanted to lean into a day part, which is daytime, which basically targets women the most out of any day part because I wanted to be able to tell stories that could inspire and elevate their lives in different ways. And I also thought daytime was such a forgotten day part because people wanted the sexy. They wanted late night and prime time. So I really felt like I could make an impact in that space. So I then went on to do almost every daytime show. Trisha I call her calls me the whore, whore, of, whore daytime. of daytime. Because she's been on every, <laughs> Rachel Ray, Tyra, Tyra. Nate Berkus. Um, but I loved the creativity and really being able to lean into stories for women. Um, and after a while, having someone who was living a parallel life to me and seeing that she was married and bought an apartment and I had- Hold on, because up until this point, she wasn't making that much because she started off as a production assistant, then had to work her way up to producer. So during that- She was my sugar mommy. Yes. That's what she's coming to. <laughs> so that's what I was trying to get to. Um, <laughs> everything she bought for herself, she bought for me, which is such a great testament to our bond and our relationship. She didn't want to have to experience life without me being by her side and without me having real time experience with what she but had. Then I have to ask myself, has she returned that? <laughs> like, as now we've, we've grown. We're equal now. Um, so... <laughs> She's like, are we, though? <laughs> um, so after looking at her life, I was reassessing where I was in my career, and I was living in a studio apartment with my two Emmys, no man, I didn't own anything, and I'm thinking, there's such an imbalance here. I've put so much of my blood, sweat, and tears in my career, but nothing else. So I had to figure out how I could translate my skill set. As a producer, you do a lot of everything. So when I literally sat down to figure out what I could do, I felt like I could do nothing. So much of who Antoinette Clark was was rolled up into that credit at the end of every show. And I had to literally sit down and write a list of what my skill set was. And when I was at the Tyra Banks show, I produced a lot of the brand integrations. Brand integrations are huge now, but back then it wasn't, aging myself again. Um, and a lot of producers didn't love playing in that space because they felt like it took away your creativity. I took it as a challenge. There's a new product and a different trend and how was I going to make it affordable and also relatable to the audience so I could basically sell it into them. So when I realized that was a part of my superpowers that a lot of producers didn't have, I leveraged that and essentially sent my resume out to different advertising agencies and networks, ended up at MSLO, Martha Stewart's company. Um, did not love it. The woman who hired me left two weeks prior to me starting. So when I started, I was a fish out of water. They weren't focused on television. They were much focused on digital and print, which my whole career and my passion point had been television for 12 years. So I then started sending out my resume again, ended up at CBS. And I've now been there eight years and I run their branded integration department for daytime. Who's the long-winded twin? <laughs> <laughs> so I love how you kind of start off being twins. I'm sure you dressed alike, same hairstyle. People can't tell the difference between yes. the two of you. And then you've kind of grown into two distinct paths, right? So you mentioned it, entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurship. I think in our society, it's like, oh, you're working for a company? Uh, you need to get your own. You need to step out and do your own and have your own business and like 
stop working for the man. And I think that, that you have both proven that there's merit in each. So can you talk a little bit about your decisions to branch out on your own versus stay at um, and work with a company and how you were able to even kind of sit in being an entrepreneur, although you're at a, a major corporation. Yeah, so I think just uh, uh, as a preface, the reason why we wrote this book was because of that, that people have, the status quo leads us to believe that there's one path to success and it's this linear road that you have to take. But we have to really figure out a way where we can basically combat the conservative conservatism of what the status quo stands for. So the book was really our effort to democratize success for people who look like us and to show that you can basically create your own blueprint because we don't look like success in our fields mm -hmm. and we made it such based on kind of the road that we took. And I think to your point, when you look at the industry, it's sexy to be an entrepreneur uh, now. I remember when, um, Articles kept coming out. I was like, I'm one of them. Like, that's cool. You feel like you're in this elite club and yeah. you're unstoppable. Um, but, and it's great, and I think the reason why I gravitated towards entrepreneurship is because I have a high tolerance for risk. Also, I always believed I could do things that other people didn't think I could do. And we all know it with our CVs and our resumes. Honestly, when you go in for a job, they look at your credentials. And I think there were often times where I thought, oh, I could do something in my way differently where I think I could impact or change what's happening at this organization. But if you didn't have the pedigree or the experience, you wouldn't get that opportunity. So I think I gravitated towards entrepreneurship because I thought I could do things that other people didn't think I was qualified for yet. And so for, with me, I knew I didn't have the stomach to be an entrepreneur. After being in production for 12 years and being on four canceled shows and having to reinvent myself after every show had gone away, I was craving stability. So when I got to CBS and I was able to build this department for them, I love having the backing and support of this infrastructure and this powerful company and not saying that I wasn't able to make an impact because that's the opposite. I was able to come in, they didn't think daytime was a formidable day part to even have this department, and now it's one of the most successful out of all of um, all the day parts. And it's really about going beyond your job description. There are so many qualities that entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs have in common. Yeah, because we're both agile, we're both curious. There's a level of foresight and vision. and vision that we share. The only thing is, I'm crafting kind of what my path is where Antoinette has to work within more confines, but I think there are ways for her to break some of those walls down so that she puts her imprint and fingerprint on something. And I think that's kind of the, 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 um, difference. the big difference, but it's showing that whatever path you take, you make it what you want it to be, and then you can basically, like when we look at Antoinette and her digging into daytime, daytime's not sexy. Everyone wants to work in prime time and in late night. She basically was able to find this white space and area where she could break down some of those walls. So I think there are instances, if you wanna be an entrepreneur, where sometimes you go to the less traveled road or area and say, and you can try things out where a lot of eyeballs aren't on you yeah. yet. But then once you start bringing in the revenue or like really driving and making change, that's when you, you, you become kind of the celebrated entity within the organization. Right, and I think a big part of what I was able to do was number one, go beyond my job description. When I was hired at CBS, I was hired as a director to oversee one show. Eight months in, I was just looking at the landscape and trying to figure out why more money wasn't coming in and why they were not focused on the other shows. And my boss was like, no one's checking for those shows. So I put together a full plan and a rate card to try to leverage the one show I was hired to do and basically figure out other opportunities for the other shows and put them together as a package. And two, month, two years into me being there, I went to them and basically said, now that we have proof of concept and we have a formidable business here, I need to be a VP, because I've now worked for free, technically. But first, guys, she was like, this is what I want to do. And I was like, okay. 
And she was like, well, do I say it like this? How do I position it? And I was like, you she know what? She propositioned for I'll her go to go in. in for me. So I was like, I'll go in. I have nothing to lose. I'll have all the confidence in the world. And I'll ask for what you deserve. I opted not to do that. And I did it. She was like, simmer down. I got this. Um, I just wanted her to know there was reinforcement. Right. Um, so I think that was one of the biggest <laughs> lessons in me becoming an entrepreneur and also driving change. You have to challenge the status quo and drive change. So for me, that meant figuring out how we could play in the white space at CBS. And that was reimagining how I was selling daytime. So there are a lot of steps to get there, but you have to have the audacity to get to that point, but also the wherewithal to stay there. And then I think too, when you look at, of course, we all know kind of archetypes of what an entrepreneur is, but net net, I think kind of some of the intangibles or the things that you have to look at within yourself is you want to be, always want to be extraordinary, no matter what job or situation that you're in. Um, I remember there were instances where my team would tell me at Narrative, your expectations are too high. There's no way we're going to be able to do this. And I'm like, guys, I didn't take this risk to be mediocre. So we're going to figure this thing out. So I think you have to... Don't let anyone talk you out of lowering your standards for where you think you should you should be. The other thing is failure. Don't don't fear it, right? Fear is basically more expensive than failure because you don't even get past go. So I really look at failure as a way to make me better and to kind of strengthen my muscles so I come out even, you know, that much stronger. Um, so and then I think the last thing is execution. Everyone has an amazing idea, but it's how you put it into action to actually make something happen. So you guys dug in, let's dig into status quo. You talked a lot about, about that and white space, right? So in the book, status quo can be your manager, it could be your family, just telling you these things about expectations, things you should be, I'm this age, I should be doing this, I'm here, I should be at this level by now. Um, but then it's also that negative self-talk of like, what am I doing? I don't deserve this. I shouldn't go for yeah. it. All that fear. Um, and, and so your responses to that is around looking for that white space, focusing in on yourself and identifying your superpowers. So can you talk about status quo? And then what are the, what's your arsenal, your Swiss army knife, as you to refer to it, it yeah. to combat it? So... so <laughs> So I think a lot of our world and culture definitely shines a grand light on the overnight success and the born leader. And if you don't fall within either of those two categories, you feel like you're, you're less than and you're stuck somewhere in the middle. None of us want to be in the middle because it's not a good place to be. The one thing we should be in the middle of is taking over. But I think the status quo makes you feel like you can't do it and it instills all this fear inside of you and they're like well if you don't have this pedigree and if you don't didn't go to this school and if you don't have this type of business acumen you can't do those things but the big problem is so many people fall prey to it but it's so many things that we talk about in our book where you have to number one figure out what your superpowers are and the biggest thing is all of us have so many superpowers but it's hard for us to identify them sometimes because you're talking about yourself a lot of us don't know how to evangelize ourselves or also socialize our stories and also have a deep level of self-reflection so you have a sense of what you do well. So we define superpower is the intersection of where your passion and expertise meet. And then you start to basically unpack that and fuel that with um, something we call the three C's. So that is cool, compassion, and confidence. Yes. <laughs> See, I'm trying to. <laughs> um, and if you look at from a confidence standpoint, you have to live in your own audacity. And basically, if you know you're passionate about something and there's a level of expertise there, share it, like activate it, ignite it, and really go for it. And then on the cool side, it's really about leaning into we all have our version of cool, it's your personal style. Cool is taste, it's foresight. It's your craft and putting that into action so that it feels inherently you. Um, and then also leaning into cultural intelligence to really drive and steer that. And then compassion, 
it's, you know, the status quo will lead us to believe that we should only care about ourselves. And if you care about yourself, that's how you're gonna get to the top. And it's actually the opposite. You really need people in your life who can help elevate you and it's a give and take. You can give to them, they can give to you and vice versa. Uh, and that's another reason why we wrote the book the way we did. The book is broken down into two parts. The first part is about really finding the power within yourself and going on to nurture it in others. So the second part is activating that into the world and with your tribe, because we all can do what we do on a daily basis by ourselves. And I think growing up as twins, that was a big component that really stuck with us. We ha knew the power of connection, but then also the need to individuate. And I think that's where a lot of that self-reflection comes in because we were always trying to figure out how we could be different. Even it was, you know that saying, same, same, but different. Because mm -hmm. we look alike, but then we're also two separate individuals. So it really led us down a journey of being able to unpack those things. And I think well, it started from when we were younger because we had that wow factor. We, our mom would dress us alike, so we were identical in clothes and face, everything. So it was like, wow, you're so cute. Wow, you're wearing matching clothes. And for the first time when we went to grammar school, we were separated. So I didn't have that wow factor because I was now a singleton in my classroom. So I had to figure out what my skill set was and what made me different and how I could have that wow factor just by myself. But Antoinette took it to another level. It was our one of our first birthdays in grammar school. At McDonald's. It was at McDonald's. Um, you know, they used to have like the a little playground. playground. Yes. yes. And that <laughs> yummy cake. <laughs> so basically, I invited friends from my class. Antoinette invited friends from her class. And everyone that I invited, they brought two gifts. One for me and one for Antoinette. Antoinette's friends, they bought one gift, one for Antoinette. So Antoinette never told people. Like, you didn't know twin? I had a twin. <laughs> so she, I was taking the singleton to, to a another whole nother level. level. I still kept our twinity intact. Um, and I remember crying because I was like, she has, I had double the gifts and, and she. I had, I had so, so there was some give and take um, when we were trying to navigate that. Um, but I think a good way to put it is being twins, we learned how to play tennis playing doubles. And then when we went to school and we were separated, now we had to figure out how to play singles. And that helped us, like I said before, really sharpen our approach to who and what we are, what makes us tick, and I think what value we bring um, into the world. But then also how we can activate when we do come together. And you know, one story comes to mind, we talk about it in, in the book too. When we were in high school, guess sweatshirts, it was like a big thing. And look, guess is back in style. Full again. circle now. <laughs> and um, our mom took a shopping and there was a place on the Upper West Side that sold Gesh sweatshirts at a discounted price. And they were real. They weren't <laughs> fake. <laughs> You're right, this wasn't like a Canal Street thing. Right. Um, and I looked at Antoinette and I was like, we should buy like 30 of these. And my mom, our mom overheard us and she was like, what are you guys gonna do with 30 shirts? I was like, we're gonna sell them. So we went back, two weeks later, we gathered up all of our allowance our holiday and our birthday money, and basically went and bought these 30 sweatshirts. And we went to Catholic school, so our mom was also like, when are you wearing this? <laughs> because you wear a uniform. Mm -hmm. So, but there were instances where like once a month we would have dress down day. So we would rock the sweatshirts and people would be like, where'd you get that? And I was like, funny you ask, we have one in our locker. <laughs> so, so within like three or four months, we sold out of our inventory and then went back and bought another batch. So we realized that too, when you have that camaraderie and kind of that superpower that where you can activate, because mine was action, Antoinette's was empathy. So we combined that to basically become a bit more enterprising in high school. So I want to go deeper into that too. When you think, when you talk about innovation, right? So whether it's through your own business or coming in through 
a company, I think a lot of us, even as at Google, we're super overachievers and we want to come in, assess the situation real quick and be like, okay, I want to change all of this, Yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but in there you talk about like, you need to learn and you need to humble yourself for a little bit. So like that balance between kind of being able to take the time needed to assess where you are, who you are, what the game is, um, before you kind of go out and like unleash your superpowers to, yeah. to the world. So can you talk about what's the right cadence for that where you don't feel like you're um, holding back, but that you do the due diligence that you need to do to then be strategic about using your superpowers? And I think, I think it, it I think it's just that. It's really leaning into um, doing your due diligence because we all go come into situations, I think, especially when you first start a job and you're like, uh, I want to change this. I would never do that. I think they should do this. But of course, it's easy to say when you're not in it. Mm -hmm. So you're always, for us, it's always about gaining a level of expertise, right? And really becoming an expert within your domain. Because the only way you can drive innovation is, is if you know what exists and what's been done and who's doing it well so you can basically reimagine and make it better. So there's a level of like never stop learning. We call it NSL, NSL. in the book where you have to really, it's almost like an education, like you're going back to school to really do your day job at this particular organization, but then see where there might be pockets of things where you, you might be able to, to impact it. Then I think it moves into like a prototype stage. You start picking and having your hypotheses and figuring out, oh, I think this is a rule that I would love to rewrite and this is how I would do it and this is what I think the outcome will be. Test that. And you keep testing until you feel like you've built up a level of expertise where you can actually drive impact and it's not you just feeling overly confident. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll turn it over to the audience. So another sort of like societal pressure that we feel and see is success, right? I started from with a dollar and now I have a hundred million dollars. Started from the bottom, now we hear, right? There's even songs about it. Um, and so it becomes a thing that we envy. It's like, wow, that person, it's kind of normalized this like tragic story of like going from the bottom and getting to the top. Can you talk about how to ignore that, <laughs> to, to go beyond what we see as success and being able to kind of carve out our own way and not have that, even that mindset of like, oh, it's already been done, like I shouldn't even try, which is another sort of status quo thing um, that we yeah. hear. Yeah. I think, so I think it's important with understanding who you are, where you are, and where you want to be. So recognizing what you want your North Star to be, because you want to be legendary versus temporary. So you can't focus on what other people are doing or even the, sh the small little wins and the failures that you're, that is happening in your life. It's about playing the long game. So we lean into it a lot in the book. We talk about listful thinking and really reflecting and figuring out what you're good at versus what you're not and what your superpowers are versus what others are. So you can be clear on your trajectory and what you want. Even obviously having an identical twin, I could be so preoccupied with her success and what she's doing, but I'm not competitive with her, nor am I'm checking for her and making sure she's good, but it inspires me to have the same level of success in a different way, not in a competitive way. Because it's almost like being twins, we experience like a crash course in humanity. in humanity. And we're really looking at, okay, there's a characteristic in Antoinette that I love and admire, so I want to start working out those muscles so I can basically have that skill set. So I think a lot of it is staying, staying your course and playing your game. But to Antoinette's point, if you have your North Star, you now set that path. So that's what you should have your eyes on. And I think one key thing in order to do that, it's having people around you that can be your elevation and your gravity when you're going through kind of that process and journey because our tribe means a lot to us and I think it has helped us to get to where we are. But that's a testament to what they bring to the table for us too and that's elevation and gravity. Love it. So let's open it up to the audience. We have two mics there if you guys have questions. 
Uh, hi, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is ZG. Uh, I have a question for you because you mentioned you asked for the promotion. And can you talk a little bit more like what preparation you did to ask for that promotion and what the conversation was? Great. Thanks. Yes. So I'm all about a deck. Um, so really trying to tell my brand story in terms of where I was at in CBS. So I literally put together a whole plan of all the new clients I had brought in, all the new business that was happening, all the additional money that I was not tasked to bring in and was able to bring in, and created this whole deck and story of what I was able to do. And honestly, a balance sheet also doesn't lie. So putting that all together and creating my career narrative for my time at CBS is what drove them and to I really see it. And I think a lot of it is almost like you want to create a story that's big enough where there's a before and after. So, you know, like those makeover shows when you see before and after, so you're like, like, oh, my it's God. It's like pre-AC, you had this. <laughs> Post-AC. That's Antoinette Clark. And they laughed when I said that because I said this was pre-AC. You made X amount of dollars. This is post AC, and they thought I was doing some like decimal system. I'm like, no, that's Antoinette Clark, free me. <laughs> so it's really, and I think a lot of women shy away from telling their stories because you think, you know, you're arrogant or, or you're going to be too boastful and it's too cocky. But you need to understand who you are and what your value proposition is and what you were able to create and share that story, socialize it with people so they understand your impact and what you were able to do. So I think it's about you being your own, the chief evangelizer of you and your brand. And no one else is gonna do it. Right, and then I was scared to do it. Obviously, I went to Trisha and she offered to go in for me, but having that confidence and her reminding me of what I was able to accomplish and what I had done made me feel more confident to go in. I used to work at Univision in the sales department, so I definitely understand rate card, brand integration, all of that good stuff. And from my experience there at some of my other, and some other places that I've worked, I realized that going in with that mentality of understanding your confidence and being seen as, you're so young in this industry, you have no idea what you're talking about, yeah. work your way up before you give the opin opinion, kind of, I'm also Caribbean, so just sit in the corner, watch, don't talk while the adults are talking yep. mentality, but realizing that then when you are given a voice, everyone's like, oh wow, that was actually very insightful and useful, but still finding that people are finding you impactful, but working within the confines of still being in corporate America and still having to have that pedigree or having to have that resume to check it off, even though it's things that are not in your job description yeah. that you're going uh, be above and beyond to doing, which things that you both did. How were you able to come to really package that together in a bow? Because a lot of times it's not always a, a, a amount it's not a dollar amount that you can show yep. it's not a new project it's not something new to the department but it's the little the little things that amount to a larger change so how have you been able to throughout your career position yourselves for those little things and tasks that you've done that amount to a bigger picture so i think once you do the work because you you're, you're right it can be small and then it could be something that's enormous but i think you need to make sure that it's being seen even if it's a collection of small things, I think it always comes back to what impact. It doesn't need to necessarily be from a revenue standpoint, but are you changing the culture? Are you influencing um, the trajectory of things or the direction that something should go in? So I always think, especially when you're starting out in an organization and you want to figure out how you work your way up, you do those small things and you go beyond your job description, but you also align yourself with the OG the disruptor and the influencer. So the OG is the person within the organization that can help, they know where the bodies are buried and they can help kind of steer you, right? To say, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. Or if you're doing that, this person will shine a light on that for you. Then you wanna align yourself with the influencer. The influencer has a high sphere of influence amongst people in the organization. So if they say it, it must be true kind of thing. And then you want the disruptor, the person that's kind of blazing trails so that you can look and learn. It's again, learn the rules, then rewrite them. So you look and learn from them and see how they've worked their way in. So it's almost like you have a reference that you want to see how they've been able to do it and then you put your spin on it. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming in. Thanks, Thanks for having for us. To build off that question. So it sounds as though both of you have taken leaps from entrepreneur, entrepreneurial way. You've really just taken yourselves to the next level. What does that look like? What does that thought process look like when you're going through, okay, so I'm gonna go from here to here. I'm going to take that leap. I'm going to take that risk. But tactically, you're organizing your receipts. That way it's a leap, but it's strategic and you know that it's going to result in something fruitful and show the tremendous value that you've been providing beforehand. Yeah, so I think a lot of that is identifying your white space. Um, because you can do all those things and then nothing happens, right? So I think you have to be prepared for some of the work that you do, it might fall flat. So you need enough in the hopper to basically test and try. But I think the first and foremost thing, it's identifying your white space. Where is there an opportunity for you to innovate, reimagine, redefine, or create a new solution to an old problem. So I think you have to pinpoint and almost map it and say, okay, based on the department that I'm in, I see a white space um, on the data side on the sales side, you know, whatever department it is. And then you basically have your hypotheses. How would I combat this? And it might be right or it might be wrong, but then I think you test it amongst your peers and then figure out ways within the workday for you to be able to do that as well. So I think having a collection of those, it gives you more confidence, even if it's not tied to your day to day, that you can accomplish it. Um, and it feels like you're bringing something to the table. I know when I first started Narrative, um, I never worked at an ad agency before. So people thought I was crazy. Like, how are you launching something and you'd, you've never worked at one? To me, I looked at it as I've been around agencies enough and they were my clients, but I've never worked inside of one. But that, to me, I looked at that as a benefit because I didn't have any preconceived notions of how it should be. I had a blank slate. But that really got me into a bad decision-making process of me wanting to hire people that had pedigree over passion and the culture that I was really trying to build. So you mentioned kind of the revenue thing. Culture is big too. If you can be kind of that, that big culture creator within the organization that boosts morale, that's hugely valuable as well. So we don't mean to say that everything has to be about dollars and cents, but I hired a lot of people that had the pedigree and checked those boxes and it was detrimental to what I was trying to build because a lot of those people, they weren't rule breakers. They just wanted to follow paths that had been set forth for them. And I had to really take a step back and say, okay, I need a mix of this. So I need expertise, but I also need kind of that cultural fit. So I started approaching it more like uh, a casting director does when they're casting for a film. So I looked at my team and said, okay, where are the holes and what other roles and skill sets do I need to fill? So net net, I think it's finding your white space and then figuring out how to move within it. So even if you're just assessing the proof points before you share it out with the world. My question is how do you balance your time when it's um, between having your own job um, at a corporation, big corporation, doing your own thing as an entrepreneur, managing um, being in a relationship, uh, time with your friends, family. How does that work for you? How do you guys manage your time? So we We're, write everything, everything down. down. Okay. So we do a lot with lists and yeah. we, our calendar, so Google Cal, we're all That's about it. That's our best it. friend. Yeah. <laughs> so we basically map um, all of the pieces and even if we don't have, say we we're thinking about hanging out with friends, mm -hmm. but it's not solidified, yeah. we'll put a placeholder so we just see what the week looks like and where we have openings for it. I think the other thing is understanding that every week isn't created equally. Mm -hmm. So there are gonna be instances where it's like a heat map. You're on red, orange, and yellow. So there might be a week where you're heavy red mm -hmm. with work and your side hustle. There might be a week where you're heavy on work, side hustle is heavy, but then you're on yellow with yeah. kind of hanging out with friends. So I think it's about mapping that out just as you would um, for a client or something like that so that you can get a sense of 
where you have openings and you make sure that you're planning the time mm -hmm. so that you have the energy to actually do all of those things. And obviously it's not easy. We've learned from experience of seeing, like I saw such a lack in my social life mm -hmm. from seeing her. So you can also take stock when you see other people living their lives and you realizing, wait a minute, I'm putting so much energy and effort into my day job, which yes, you should, mm -hmm. but sometimes you need to put just as much energy into your personal life because you need that balance. Otherwise, you're not going to be a happy person. And that fuels your output when you're at work. Like I remember I started a program at Narrative. It was Culturati, where every month I would give one of my team members depending on what they wanted to do, a budget to basically go experience. And then that following Friday, we would have a share out with the team. So if it was Murakami at X Museum or going to X Talk or going to the box, yeah. the burlesque club, you know, so that you basically bring back it's like you're Christopher Columbus. You're collecting all these artifacts and learnings and insights mm -hmm. and you having those experiences have an impact on basically how you move forward. So basically being able to impart that. So I think it's super important to have that balance, but it's a lot easier said yeah, than, than done. done. But the calendar has helped us a lot. Okay, last question. How much sleep do you get? And what time do you wake up? <laughs> okay. So we sleep, we sleep four, four to five, five hours. hours. Oh. Um, and I, when I, I split my time between New York and LA, so I'm in LA half the time. When I'm in LA, I stay in New York time-ish. So I wake up at five o'clock every morning when I'm in LA and start my day as if I'm in New York, even if that means my first conference call is in my bed. Wow. Um, and then when I'm here, I wake up at seven. Yeah, about seven. And then um, we have a quick regimen. We'll, 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 we'll meditate. I, I talked her into buying a Peloton. So we both have Pelotons. <laughs> Guys, my Peloton so holds my clothes, not me. <laughs> so basically, basically when we wake up, so the two dummies walked into Peloton and we were like, we're going to buy two. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, should we be doing this? <laughs> so now the regimen is I look over to that Peloton and I'm like, is this going to be the day? <laughs> And some days it some is, days but it is. most days it's not. It's not. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're up and at it, and I think we always have a playlist, and that kind of gets our vibe going for for that day, and I think gives us a lot of energy because we don't sleep that much. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Trisha and Antoinette, thank for being here today. Thank, thank you, you guys. guys.